Hello, this is a video demonstration of free-floating immunohistochemistry, also known as IHC for short, with multiple rounds of tyramide signal amplification, also known as TSA for short. This technique is best done on fixed tissue sections that are at least 30 micrometers thick or thicker. This method also allows for better penetration of stains into tissue, as well as greater ease in trying to stain the tissue compared to using slides in a lot of different cases. For background information on how this works, I highly recommend you see the other video before watching through this one. I've provided a link in the description for that video that will also link back to this once you're done. Pour 1x PBS into the basin. Uncover your stored sections in PBS plus azide or otherwise cryoprotectant and retrieve the sections in clumps. Here you can see I'm reaching in with a bent paper clip to pull them out much like hanging them on the end of the bent paper clip tip. Here we see again how I'm reaching into the solution with the bent paper clip, not by stabbing the tip of the paper clip through the sections, but instead trying to reach under clumps of sections and lift it up like a hanger. You do not want to drag the sections along the wall of the well in case that causes some tearing. You want to basically just lift them straight out of the solution. Here are the staining tools you will use, the netted insert and basin. In order to make sure the basin is ready for use, it needs to have water squirted through it. If you try to insert it dry, there is a sort of hydrostatic repulsion that happens where the water won't actually go through the nets. So I like to squirt through it with a distilled water squirt bottle. After prepping the net well, retrieve another basin that the net well will fit into and pour PBS solution into it. Then, carefully insert the net well down at an angle to avoid having air bubbles go up through the net. Here, I am isolating specific sections of interest and migrating them individually to the netted insert. So, in the same fashion as before, I try to reach underneath the sections and lift them up much like a sort of hanger, rather than dragging them across the walls of the basin that they're in. Here, when they're in this sort of uh, basin and all in a giant clump, it's important to tease them apart and get single sections separated out from the others. And here I'm also selecting specific parts of the brain where the sections are coming from in case that I have sections that go across the entire brain. In case they get a bit sticky on the paper clip, you can shake them off in the net wall. Now that we have our sections in the netted insert, we can replace the solution in the associated basin with PBS plus 0.05% sodium azide, as you see here. This PBS plus azide step is one of two important steps that deactivate endogenous peroxidases in the tissue. Reinsert the netted insert into the basin. An important note for any time that you take your netted insert out to replace the solution in the basin, do not ever put the netted insert on an absorbent surface like a paper towel. In this specific example, this is not okay and it will suck all the water out of the sections and cause them all to clump together. You want to avoid this. Instead, you want to rest your net wells, especially when there are sections in them, on a non-absorbent smooth surface such as this tabletop here. This case is fine. You can always clean up the residual water or other solutions with a paper towel and some cleaning agents later. Alternatively, you can rest it on a dedicated tray where certain residues can accumulate and then be cleaned off later as well if the countertop is not okay. 
now migrate the netted insert plus basin onto your shaker in a container in order to prevent spillage. Set the speed to an appropriate speed that will cause the sections to shake and agitate without causing spillage out of the basin. Here we are making a slightly diluted hydrogen peroxide solution. We are using store-bought 3% hydrogen peroxide and diluting it in one parts the original solution and two parts 1x PBS. In this case 10 ml of the store-bought peroxide and 20 ml of PBS. Retrieve your net well from the shaker take out the netted insert, rest it on a smooth surface, discard the solution in the basin into your waste beaker, and replace it now with the 1% hydrogen peroxide solution, and reinsert the netted insert. Put the net well back onto the shaker, and have it shake for 10 minutes in this diluted hydrogen peroxide solution. This is the second of the two endogenous peroxidase inactivating steps that is necessary to prevent background staining. Retrieve your net well, remove the netted insert, discard the solution in the basin, and then replace it with regular 1x PBS. Reinsert the netted insert. And place the net well back on the shaker. After five minutes of shaking, remove the net wells, then remove the netted insert from the basin, discard the solution in the basin as waste, set the netted insert on the counter, not a paper towel, and then pour new PBS solution into the basin, then reinsert the netted insert, and then put the net well back on the shaker. And after another five minutes, do the same solution swap of PBS one more time. What you just saw were three consecutive five minute each PBS rinses. So we call it rinsing because we're basically rinsing off the residues of prior reagents. And we do more than one of these rinses in order to completely dilute out all those residues from whatever the prior reagent was. So typically between reagents such as between the peroxide and what will be the primary antibody step next as well as various other things you're going to see later in this protocol I do three consecutive five minute rinses or what I call rinsing three by five. So that's important to note for later. After the rinses are complete, you're going to replace the solution in the basin with your primary antibody solution. In this case, I use a cocktail. I don't have this depicted in video, but it's pretty much the same thing of just pouring it into the basin and reinserting the netted insert. When it comes to primary incubation, I incubate it overnight at room temperature, although some other labs prefer to do this at fridge temperature, like 4 degrees Celsius. It's important that regardless of where you're incubating it, whether it's in the fridge or out at room temperature, that you seal up your container in Tupperware in order to prevent evaporation. Otherwise, solutions will go down, sections will dry out, and it'll cause a mess and loss of sections. When you return the next day, you should make the secondary antibody solution first before doing anything with the net well that's currently on the shaker. This is due to the fact that making the secondary antibody solution can take some time, as well as the fact that the secondary antibody solution should be made fresh right before use. I will first make the donkey anti-rabbit HRP conjugated secondary antibody. This will be used to tag one of the primary antibodies, specifically the rabbit anti-delta FOS B primary antibody that was stained on the tissue before. When making this fresh, 
the first ingredient will be regular 1x PVS. It's important that this PVS has zero sodium azide in it, as sodium azide will inhibit the horseradish peroxidase, HRP, and cause the secondary antibody to just not work at all. The next ingredient that I'm adding is Triton X100, a surfactant that helps antibodies infiltrate the tissue. I'm using a stock solution of 10%, so that's one part uh, Triton concentrate in nine parts distilled water in order for better pipetting out of it. And I'll add 200 microliters into the uh, working solution for the secondary antibody. In this next part, we're adding the final and important ingredient, 66 microliters of the HRP Donkey Anti-Rabbit stock, which I already have pre-diluted in a 1 to 2 ratio. And so we're adding this, and this should give us a final concentration of about 1 to 300, or otherwise 3.33 micrograms per milliliter. Swirl lightly to mix. Do not shake, otherwise this will create foam and air bubbles that will be annoying to deal with later. Slow the shaker speed until it has stopped, and carefully remove the Tupperware lid, making sure to keeping it level and avoiding any shaking. Remove net walls carefully, keeping them level as well. Retrieve the vial that contained the primary antibody previously, and prop it up in a holder as depicted here. Remove the netted insert from its basin, set it on the counter, not on a paper towel. Take the basin and pour the solution in the basin into the primary antibody solutions storage vial as shown here. Put the cast back on the tubes and place the tubes in the fridge door as shown here. We need to rinse off the residues of the primary antibody solution that are still on the tissue. And we do this with one of those 3x5 rinses. Start by adding 1x PBS to the netwell basin. Set the netwell on the shaker, have it shake for 5 minutes. Then discard the solution from the basin of the net well and replace that solution with more 1x PBS. Once more, set that net well plus basin on the shaker, have it shake for 5 minutes, then again discard the solution in the basin and replace it with more 1x PBS. Yet again, set the net well plus basin on the shaker, have it shake for 5 minutes, then afterward discard the solution from the basin. However, this time we're not going to replace it with PBS, but instead we're going to finally incubate the tissue in our freshly made first secondary antibody solution. Place the net wall on the shaker and let it shake this time for two hours. It's okay if it goes a little over two hours, uh, three hours might be a bit long, but aim for two hours. And I recommend during this time sealing the net well and basin in Tupperware in order to prevent evaporation of the solutions. After the two hour secondary antibody incubation is complete, we will discard the solution as waste. Unfortunately, it cannot be salvaged as it does not keep for very long. Rinse off the secondary antibody residues with yet another round of three times five minutes each 1x PBS rinses as we've done before. While we're waiting on the last rinse, we need to prep the fluorescein tyramide working solution. We start off by pouring into a beaker 10 milliliters of fresh 1x PBS solution. We then retrieve the fluorescein tyramide stock solution from the freezer, which is 1 milligram per milliliter in ethanol, 
and we apply 33 microliters of this stock into the beaker in order to obtain a 1 to 300 dilution. We then retrieve the final ingredient, 3% hydrogen peroxide, and take out 10 microliters. When added to the beaker, this results in a 0.003% hydrogen peroxide solution. Retrieve the net well from the shaker, discard the PBS solution in the basin, and replace it with this freshly made fluorescein tyramide 1 to 300 working solution. Leave the net well to incubate in this fluorescein tyramide solution on the shaker for 20 minutes. Afterward, discard this fluorescein tyramide from the basin into non hazardous waste. Add 1 XPBS plus 0.05% azide to that basin and place back on shaker for 10 minutes in order to deactivate the HRP from the previous antibody step. While you are waiting, make 1% hydrogen peroxide solution, which involves mixing 10 mL of 3% hydrogen peroxide solution with 20 mL of 1x PBS. When ready, replace the 1x PBS plus 0.05% azide solution in the basin with 1% hydrogen peroxide, and place back on shaker for 10 minutes. This ensures full deactivation of the HRP donkey anti-rabbit secondary antibody from previous steps. When finished with the peroxide step, perform three five-minute PBS rinses and discard the used peroxide as non-hazardous waste. While waiting on that last PBS rinse, begin making the next secondary antibody working solution, HRP Donkey Anti-Mouse 1 to 300. Add 10 milliliters 1x PBS. Add 200 microliters of a 10% Triton X100 solution. And I added 66 microliters of the antibody stock, which was already pre-diluted 1 to 2. Swirl gently and don't shake. Discard the PBS in the net well, pour in this fresh antibody solution, and set it on the shaker for two hours. When you return, discard this antibody solution and perform PBS rinses. While waiting on that last PBS rinse, begin making the rhodamine tyramide 1 to 1000 working solution. We diluted a bit more than other solutions as it seems to have higher background staining on average. Add 10 milliliters PBS. Add 10 microliters of 3% hydrogen peroxide. Add 10 microliters of rhodamine tyramide stock. Swirl gently, don't shake. Discard PBS in Netwell, pour in this rhodamine tyramide solution, and set it on the shaker for 20 minutes. When finished, discard the rhodamine tyramide solution as non-hazardous waste. Then perform two 5-minute 
distilled water rinses. While waiting on the last rinse, make a DAPI 2 micrograms per milliliter working solution. Distilled water must be used as a dilutant because otherwise DAPI will precipitate in PBS. An additional caution, DAPI is a carcinogen. You must wear gloves and protective equipment if you have not already been doing so. Add 10 milliliters distilled water. And add 200 microliters from a 0.1 milligram per milliliter stock. Discard the distilled water in the net well basin, pour in this fresh DAPI solution, and set it on the shaker for 10 minutes. When finished, discard this DAPI solution as hazardous waste as it is a carcinogen and perform two five-minute distilled water rinses. Also, each of these rinses should be discarded as hazardous waste due to DAPI contamination. That's the end of the staining process. Now to do one of the following. You can either prepare to mount your sections on slides now, or if you don't have time, put sections in PBS plus azide and store them in the fridge in an airtight container to prevent evaporation. Please note that sections stored in PBS plus azide in the fridge when in an airtight container can last for many months, possibly years, without degradation. Regardless of whether you store the sections and mount them later, or instead you mount the sections onto slides right after staining, here are some examples of how to do that. Begin by migrating the sections from storage or from their net well into a basin that's filled with PBS. Use a bent paper clip in order to move the sections. Wet in a paintbrush with PBS solution and add that solution to the slide. It makes it easier for the sections to come off of the brush later on when you mount them. Pick up sections from the dish with the brush by gently swooping the brush underneath the section and lifting it out of the solution. Here's an example of mounting a section steamroller style by positioning the section between the brush and the slide and rolling the brush over the top of it. Here's an example of mounting a section with conveyor belt style, where the section is on top of the brush and the brush rolls out from underneath as the section goes onto the slide. You can carefully poke at sections with a brush in order to reposition and unfold them on the slide. Having slides tilted up slightly will cause the fluid that's deposited on the slide to run down toward the edge of the slide. This will make it easier for you to use a paper towel to dab off the excess solution, and this will then allow the slide to dry much faster. Let the sections on the slide dry for at least 20 minutes, preferably in a dark, arid place. 
You can use a fan in order to speed up that drying process, but I don't tend to do this as it may deposit dust onto the sections and slide. Slides must be cover sloped with a medium that makes the sections partly to fully transparent. I use polyvinyl alcohol medium that I make in the lab. Please see my website link in the description of this video, as my recipe for that medium may be available there. When sucking PVA medium into a bulb transfer pipette or an auto pipetter, give it a few moments for it to suck into the actual chamber. Otherwise, it can pull up air bubbles and then it could start creating a foamy mess. Apply a few drops of PVA mountant onto the slide and then spread it out onto all the sections to the best of your ability using either the tip of the pipette or a dedicated brush for doing so. When applying a cover slip, rather than laying it down flat, lay it down instead at a slight angle in order to let air escape from underneath it. If needed, you can lightly press on the cover slip in order to help the PVA spread out onto the slide and all the sections. If you find out that you didn't apply enough PVA medium underneath the cover slip, you can apply drops at the edges of the cover slip in order to cause some of it to wick inward and underneath the cover slip. It's important to leave the cover slip slides flat and drying in the dark, arid location for at least one day. Movement or otherwise tilting might cause the cover slip to sag or fall off entirely. Leaving slides to dry for longer periods can increase the transparency of the sections by increasing the refractive index based on how PVA is drying out. Once the PVA has rubberized around the edges of the cover slip, the slide should be ready for viewing under an epifluorescent microscope. Here is an example of a finalized stain using this protocol. After viewing each color separately, so blue separate from green, separate from red, the colors were overlaid. The software used for this overlaying, as well as balancing the colors for better visibility in this image, is the software known as ImageJ, also called Fiji. Here in this image, we see a lot of overlap of the three different colors, with DAPI creating a good counter stain throughout the tissue, as well as an arrow indicating here where there's a significant amount of Delta Fos B staining in green and C Fos staining in red in the rat posterior insula. That's it. Thanks for watching.